Hello there, Basil Khan. It's great to be back and able to speak at this event, this awesome venue. My name is Maxwell Elliott. I'm the uh, staff iOS build engineer at Tinder, and I'm the author of Basil Diff, a popular target selection system. Today, I want to talk to you about swiping left on monolithic targets and why you should be motivated to do so. Anyone that's worked in a code base for an extended period of time has written code in a monolith. All software projects contain at least one monolithic target, and the existence alone of a monolith is not a reason to act on it. For example, monoliths that are, re that are rarely edited uh, do not pose a large threat to your organization. Yet monoliths that are under constant and active development are bad for your organization's health. Continued exposure to least optimal implementations increases the likelihood of a contributor adopting similar suboptimal patterns. However, edits on the periphery of a target are not burdened by these unfortunate implementations. So what is a monolith? Defining monoliths is not a one-size-fits-all process. There's a number of factors that come into play. Subjectively, monoliths pose a threat that are not just bound by build times. They're also a reflection of the culture of your code base. Broken window fallacies driven by monoliths are very hard to uh, tame and manage. There's also an allure of going back into the monolith as standards uh, outside of it begin to increase. Low or non-existent test coverage in some of the most sensitive code makes it hard to push for coverage throughout the rest of the code. Fortunately, there are some good metrics we can use to determine if a, a target is a monolith. Rebuilt targets by transitive dependencies is a function of the influence a target has over the build graph multiplied by the number of times the target was invalidated over a period of time. Edit history. How often is this target edited in comparison to other targets in the graph? The percentage of local builds of the target compared to other targets. And finally, the quality of the test coverage for the monolith source. Not just one of these metrics is sufficient to determine if a target is a monolith. Likely, it'll be a combination of these metrics al alongside some subjective qualities of the target. So let's say you found your monolith and you're ready to swipe left on it. There are some steps you'll need to take before rolling your sleeves up. First, determine what level of test coverage exists on the target. Is it none, superficial coverage, or meaningful coverage? This is important to understand since you'll need to communicate the risk that, uh, that it could impact stakeholders and that what they could experience during these migrations. Next, you should create run books and documentation on how this migration will work and ensure that QA and leadership are onboarded and aligned as you will require sign off on these changes. These documents will also be vital to stakeholders in the event of regressions. Finally, the scope of decomposition is massive. It's important to find opportunities to safeguard the effort while not attempting to solve all problems at the same time. Attempts to solve the world can easily derail decomposition projects, especially as the scope rapidly expands. So here's an overview of the workflow that we use internally to decompose monoliths. First, we use a custom rule to collect an index store, an artifact used by features such as indexing from a target, and we feed it into a transformer. This next tool, the transformer, converts the index store artifact into a JSON mapping of references and declarations for every file on the target. After the transformer does its work, we then parse the output again and we create a directed graph based on the references and declarations in every file. We then take this result and feed it into a graph analysis tool. We use NetworkX in Python to do this. During this next phase, we use logic in our graph analysis tooling to tell us which files to extract in exact, which phase of decomposition. We use the term phase to represent a series of files that should be extracted together at the same time as dictated by their graph characteristics. Finally, we extract the identified files from the target. I've added an asterisk here because moving the files is very easy, but healing the graph afterward is very challenging. Internally, we have a suite of tools that automatically heal our build graph after an extraction. I would advise teams to lean into automation as for fixing common errors, as there can be thousands of trivial and repetitive edits needed post-extraction. After we've extracted a set of files, we begin from the, set at the top and we begin our next phase. 
Sometimes graph algorithms are not needed to identify a set of files to extract from a target, simply because your eyes can see the pattern in the target. Above is an example of one of our targets. As you can see, there's a nice and tight grouping of files inside the target. Using this visualization can be a powerful tool to motivate owning teams to accept the change, given that the file graph already denotes this as a grouping of logic. I hope that your teams will be able to decompose monoliths as easily as they see here, but it's often more likely that there'll be no human discernible subgraphs in the target. In that case, you'll need to use graph algorithms to select which files to extract. When you're able to see opportunities to extract files based on subgraphs, you'll need to act on leafs of the graph instead. Using this approach, you'll be able to extract leafs in the order of their degree. It's critical that this is done in order, otherwise you will enter into cycles and your change sets will balloon in size. This approach is guaranteed to be the least amount of effort to extract each set of leaf files from the target, yet great care must be taken to ensure reviewability of these change sets. Automations around the necessary edits can greatly assist code owners as since reviewers, this will be one of the most challenging reviews for code owners they may have ever done on the target. And there's probably no existing test coverage. So what's the results of us using this workflow internally? We've had very impressive results across the board. For our most locally built target, we've reduced the build time from 160 seconds to 36 seconds. By percentage, that represents a 77% reduction in local build time for our developers and our most built target. Year to date, we've moved over 1,000 files from our monolith into the destination target. Using this destination target, we're able to work with owning teams to migrate code into existing modules or completely new modules. We expect that by end of year, our largest monolith will have reduced the line count by 75%. So on with the recap. So monoliths under, on, under active development are bad for your organization's health. Monoliths are a solvable problem. And decomposition is an objective and a repeatable process for solving monoliths. And that's all I have. Thank you.